Hello and welcome to today's symposium panel on China and international institutions. My name is Gwen Mexis and I'm a senior in EPIC studying international relations at Tufts. Hi everyone, my name is Carlos Sirisari and I'm also a senior at Tufts. I've been helping Gwen put this panel together and it's my third time in EPIC this year so I'm really excited to be part of yet another great symposium. Um, this year, I'll be helping out more backstage for the sake of focusing on the content of this discussion. We're not going to have two moderators. I'm going to let Gwen take the speaking roles, um, but it's a pleasure to meet all of you. China's increasing role in international institutions reflects the country's reemergence as a major player on the global stage. And China's increasingly assertive behavior reflects that the nation seeks to increase its influence in global governance. The country's president, Xi Jinping, has stated that China should, quote, lead the reform of the global governance system, demonstrating that the state has the intention of shaping international institutions to reflect their values and priorities. Throughout today's panel, we will be discussing China's growing role in a variety of international institutions, from peacekeeping in the UN to economic institutions like the World Trade Organization. In some of these spaces, China has conformed to global norms, and in others, the country has pushed against them, a contrast that we will explore more in today's discussion. Before I introduce our panelists, I want to explain how our panel will run. For the purposes of encouraging as much discussion as possible, each panelist has been asked to give opening remarks of about five minutes. Then we will open the panel to discussion and conversation among our speakers, before opening it up to the audience for questions and answers. We have a distinguished group of panelists with us today. Joining us are Dr. James Bacchus and Mr. Richard Gowing. Gowan. I will give a brief introduction about some of the work they have done in context of our panel prior to their opening remarks. In the chat, you'll find a link to the symposium program with their full bios. Our first panelist will be Dr. James Bacchus. Dr. Bacchus is the Distinguished University Professor of Global Affairs and the Director of the Center for Global Economic and Environmental Opportunity at the University of Central Florida. He was the founding judge and twice the chairman, the chief judge of the highest court of the World Trade Organization, the, the appellate body of the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. He was also a congressional representative for the state of Florida. Dr. Bacchus, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And let me begin, first of all, uh, by saying hello to Richard and uh, by also congratulating the students at Tufts on uh, organizing this uh, great program. Yours is an outstanding university in all kinds of ways. Uh, briefly, let me uh, explain where things stand with respect to China in the WTO. The Bertelsmann Foundation uh, conducted a, a study uh, last year about the benefits 
to all 164 member countries of the World Trade Organization from being members of the organization. And the study concluded that every single member of the WTO has benefited economically by being a member of the WTO. Number one on the list of beneficiaries, uh, despite what we often hear in our own politics uh, from both parties here in the United States, is the United States of America. We benefited more than anyone else. But number two on the list and not far behind us is China. Uh, China spent 13 years negotiating its entry into uh, the WTO and finally uh, was successful in acceding to membership in 2001. Uh, China wanted very much to uh, secure the benefits that come from uh, being a member in terms of lower barriers to trade and goods and services worldwide. Uh, China also wanted uh, the safeguards against trade discrimination that WTO rules provide. In its early years as a member of the WTO, China was uh, rather quiet uh, in uh, exercising its role of membership. Uh, in the first decade of this century, uh, China spent a great deal of time um, learning how to be a WTO member. In the past decade, China has uh, profited from its earlier approach and has increasingly become uh, much more of a leader within the councils of the WTO. Uh, in uh, the past five years, China has become even uh, more of a presence in the WTO because of the uh, absence uh, in uh, many respects of the United States from uh, its previous uh, role of WTO leader. Uh, during the administration of uh, our previous president, Donald Trump, uh, the United States turned away from uh, multilateralism in trade, turned away from the rules of, of trade, and turned toward uh, a much more confrontational uh, uh, attitude uh, on a bilateral basis with a number of countries, including especially uh, China. Uh, this is magnified uh, the Chinese presence in the WTO. Uh, the Chinese uh, have been for the most part a productive and constructive member of the WTO. Uh, one thing that may surprise uh, Americans given what they've been told is that when uh, the Chinese had been uh, brought to the bar of legal justice and WTO dispute settlement by other countries and found not to have complied with their treaty obligations, they have uh, a better record of complying with uh, rulings against them than we Americans do. Where the Chinese have fallen short, however, is in uh, their overall compliance with many of the uh, thousands of pages of the WTO treaty. In many respects, in their vast country, they have tried to comply. In many respects, they have. There's been a great transformation of the Chinese uh, economy in the past generation, uh, sparked in no small part by uh, the need to comply with China's treaty obligations as a member of the WTO. Yet in many areas, um, intellectual property, for example, technology transfer requirements, for example, and others, uh, China has not uh, acted consistently with its WTO obligations. So we are looking at a class that uh, uh, is proverbially uh, half full. Where we go now uh, in the WTO will depend to a great extent on the participation and the attitude of China, just as it will on the, the participation and attitude of the new administration of the United States and President Joe Biden. Uh, the WTO uh, is 
in many respects in need of modernization. Uh, just to cite one example, uh, while uh, there are WTO rules that apply to digital trade, there are no WTO rules that are written specifically for digital trade. Mm -hmm. This makes no sense in uh, the economy of the 21st century. This is just one of many examples of where WTO rules need to be updated, revised, modernized, and uh, improved and reimagined to advance global sustainable development. China can play an important role here. China must play an important role here if we are going to be able to achieve sustainable development worldwide, including through lowering barriers to trade. But as I said, equally important is that the United States reassert its role as a leader in the WTO in working alongside uh, like-minded countries. I will stop there for now and look forward to uh, any questions uh, you may have. Uh, there are, as I'm sure you uh, imagine, uh, endless nuances to all that I've just said. Thank you, Dr. Backus, for your comments. I'm sure we'll expand on them later in the Q&A and the discussion. Our next panelist is Mr. Richard Gowan. Mr. Gowan is the UN Director for the International Crisis Group. He oversees the crisis group's advocacy work at the United Nations, liaison with diplom liaisoning with diplomats and UN officials in New York. He has worked with the European Council on Foreign Relations, the New York University Center on International Cooperation, and the Foreign Policy Center in London. He has also taught at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia in Stanford in New York. Mr. Gowan, over to you. Thank you very much, Gwen. Um, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, as you. As you said, I used to teach at uh, Columbia and uh, I think at Columbia, we like to think of, you know, that we live in a bipolar world. There's the Fletcher School and then there's SEPA and we are the great, the two great rivals of the Northeast in foreign policy affairs. But um, I've had a number of chances to come to, to Tufts and it's a, a great university and I'm only sad I'm not there physically. Uh, with you today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, China's role in the UN system um, and in many ways the the story of China and the UN tracks with the story that James was describing uh, in the WTO. Uh, China has become uh, significantly uh, more heavily invested in the UN over the last 10 years. And there was a real turning point, I think, in 2015, when Xi Jinping um, made to date his only visit to the UN General Assembly. And that uh, clearly launched uh, a new focus um, in the Chinese system on the UN, uh, covering issues like development and peacekeeping. Uh, China has been lobbying very hard to get more senior jobs in the organization. It's been lobbying hard to get language endorsing the Belt and Road Initiative into UN resolutions. And in Geneva, uh, China has been working hard to establish some of its norms um, of domestic and international affairs in the Human Rights Council, um, pushing back on Western liberal norms, uh, which have tended to be uh, dominant in UN discussions since the end of the Cold War. Uh, when I first started working on the UN in 2005, China was hardly even an afterthought. Its views on the organization only really came into focus uh, in situations such as the Darfur crisis, where one of China's close allies was involved. Today, China is omnipresent in UN discussions, and um, it, is a, you know, it is obviously uh, challenging the way the system works. But I would make a couple of points. And I think sometimes we treat China uh, perhaps even a little too seriously in the UN system and we overstate um, how great its influence has become. Uh, firstly, China's investment in the UN remains hugely variable. It certainly is a very significant player now, 
in uh, development discussions, but on most issues in the Security Council, uh, although more assertive than in the past, China is actually still quite cautious and still looks for compromise with the US and other Western powers where it can. Um, in the humanitarian space, China is still hardly an actor. If you look at the budgets of the World Food Programme or um, UNHCR, the Refugees Agency, you know, the US gives enormous sums um, every single year. China gives to both agencies one or two million dollars each. Nothing. Peanuts. Much less than um, uh, even private donors give to both those organizations. China has not invested in the humanitarian space and is still not a player in that space. Even though China certainly is uh, filling more senior jobs in the UN, um, that is actually also still something which is sometimes overestimated. The Nordic countries combined uh, still hold far more uh, senior UN posts than China does. And that's in part because Nordic diplomats, European diplomats, and indeed US officials um, have a quite well-established understanding of how the UN system works. Whereas Chinese officials do not really have great depth on issues like peacekeeping and are still learning how the organization operates. Coming last to peacekeeping, um, which is the issue that I focused on most with regards to China. Here again, we see uh, quite a large uh, divergence between rhetoric and reality. In 2015, as I say, Xi, Xi Jinping came to New York, and while he was here, he promised 8,000 new peacekeepers, uh, 8,000 Chinese blue helmets, to reinforce um, uh, UN peacekeeping operations in places like the Sudans. And that really seized the imagination of many diplomats and UN officials. And if you talk to many ambassadors in New York today, they will tell you that this is remarkable, that China has deployed 8,000 new peacekeepers and China is dominating UN peacekeeping. There's only one problem with this narrative. China hasn't deployed any of those peacekeepers. In 2015, there were about 3,000 um, PLA troops on UN missions. Today, there are actually slightly fewer, um, under 3,000. China has trained um, more peacekeepers. It probably will deploy more in future, but in part because it lost a couple of troops, very sadly, in Mali and um, South Sudan in 2015, it's actually been very cautious about deploying its personnel. So um, the reality is, is that China is not actually dominating UN peacekeeping. Now, it deploys more peacekeepers than any other of the P5, sure, but it is still not actually anything like the giant, giant player in peacekeeping that it's sometimes described as. So what I'm driving at is that I think, you know, China is obviously a rising force, in multilateralism and it will rise further and just as in the WTO the Trump administration created a lot of political space for China we've seen that a lot in the UN over the last four years um, Chinese diplomats really enjoyed telling their European counterparts for example that while Trump was a unilateralist China was a guardian of the existing multilateral system but the reality is not quite on a par with the rhetoric in so many areas China is still learning the ropes it's got a good narrative and frankly, a lot of US observers who want to see China as being 10 feet high actually, um, to some extent, contribute to that narrative by talking up China's influence. But time and again, when you look at the realities, uh, Beijing is still a bit further down the multilateral learning curve than we sometimes assume. Thank you, Mr. Gowan, for your remarks. And before we engage with questions from the audience, I want to invite the, our panelists to pose questions to one another and give them the opportunity to respond to one another's comments if they have anything they want to respond to. I'll just say I, I, I learned from listening uh, to Richard and I'm eager to hear more. I won't learn anything today from listening to myself. <laughs> James, I, I would like to ask you a question about um, the WTO, which is during the, the Trump period, um, the European Union played a sort of a significant part trying to keep um, the WTO going. And the EU tended to frame China as a partner, as, as I understand it in that process. Um, 
you know, do you think that more generally in trade affairs, uh, the Chinese take the EU seriously as a um, as a glo as a global player, um, or, or or is the focus really always on the sort of the balance with the U.S.? I, I think the Chinese focus more on the United States uh, for geopolitical and commercial reasons. Um, the Europeans increasingly focus on China as well as the United States for both geopolitical and commercial uh, reasons. The two-way trade between the EU and China, as I'm sure you know, has increased significantly. Uh, you're right uh, in your impression that the EU has uh, tried very hard to hold things together within the WTO. The European Union is uh, very much committed uh, to multilateralism in trade. Um, the member states have different views on uh, the extent to which they want to free trade. Um, this is true of different sectors and different states in the United States as well, but the Europeans have been adamant in supporting the multilateral system. One of the issues we're facing in trade because of uh, uh, the general turning away from uh, our trade liberalization and because of the uh, Trump led turning away from the WTO is retaining the centrality of the uh, WTO in world trade. And this is something that I think is essential. Uh, so do the Europeans. Uh, the Chinese say they agree with this, and I think they do. For example, in the absence of WTO rules against uh, non discrimination, uh, the Chinese would be facing trade discrimination in every other country on the planet. Uh, the United States is uh, more ambivalent here. Um, the Trump administration refused to say that uh, the WTO was central to trade, despite both parties dating back 75 years, uh, uh, saying that routinely uh, in, in the past. Um, it's unclear the extent to which uh, the Biden administration will truly embrace multilateralism and trade uh, once again. And likewise, it's uh, even more unclear the extent to which the Biden administration will endorse freer trade, uh, which uh, both parties have traditionally endorsed in the past, despite some backsliding along the way. Um, I think the Europeans are going to pay, play a, a key role going forward, um, uh, along with the US uh, and the EU and half a dozen other major countries. All right, with that, I guess we'll get started with questions from the audience. I'll remind our audience, if you have any questions, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And again, to our panelists, if at any point you wanna to respond uh, to a comment made by a fellow panelist, please let us know and uh, we'll make sure to give you the floor to do that. So our first question is from an Epic student, Arjun. With the rise in regional cooperative economic and military agreements, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, has the power of the UN Security Council dwindled? And what about the WTO? Have they lost their monopoly over international norms and the rule of law? And either of you can take the floor and then we can switch, switch to the other person. I'll let Richard go first since I just spoke. Um, I mean, look, firstly, has the Security Council uh, dwindled? Um, over the last decade, yes, clearly. And you know, on issues such as Syria um, or Ukraine, um, the council has been either tortured or, or just irrelevant. I would say that if you talk to council diplomats, um, the uh, you know the role of China is still secondary by some distance to the role of Russia. Um, the story of the Security Council since uh, really the, the Libya conflict exactly 10 years ago has been that Russia has become uh, increasingly willing to obstruct um, 
US positions or European positions. China has often been um, supportive of Russia, although not consistently so, but it's definitely the Russians who, who are at the sort of um, the great disruptor in, in New York. Um, what's interesting is that the Chinese do still recognize that um, they have some interest in cooperating with uh, the Western countries in the council. Um, I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, one from a few years ago, uh, actually I would say one of the few notable UN successes of the Trump administration was that Nikki Haley um, was able to negotiate some very serious sanctions on uh, DPRK, North Korea, in 2017. Um, and the Chinese evidently saw that they needed to work with the US at the UN to stop the DPRK crisis um, escalating out of control in Trump's first year in office. And that diplomatic cooperation was pretty good. Uh, right now, we have the crisis in Myanmar and what's fascinating is that, again, the Chinese are trying to uh, keep working with the US and the UK um, to put some pressure through the Security Council on the generals in Myanmar after the coup. Now, the Chinese are profoundly skeptical of UN sanctions. Um, they're certainly not going to support a military intervention. I don't think anyone is. But um, behind the scenes, cooperation has actually been quite good between um, the UK, the US and, and China on, on Myanmar recently. And so I, you know, I don't think that China is ever going to be an easy partner in the council. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of tensions in the council in you know, the last year over COVID-19, over Hong Kong, over, over the Uyghurs, but it is still a channel where some cooperation remains um, possible. In response uh, to the question, which is a very good one, um, the WTO has, for the past 20 years, found it difficult to uh, revise its current rules or write any new rules. I referred to this earlier. Uh, there's great need to modernize rules on many fronts. This is largely because of um, a WTO rule in practice of um, not agreeing on anything until everyone's agreed on everything. Requirement for consensus. This has kept uh, the WTO for the most part from negotiating uh, new global trade agreements with one or two exceptions. And yet the members of the WTO have, have needed to move forward with improving the rules frameworks uh, that encourage trade. So increasingly uh, they have done so uh, on uh, the basis of uh, bilateral and regional trade and other economic arrangements. And there has been a proliferation of hundreds of these agreements. Some of them are well known. Uh, the uh, the new NAP that we call in the United States, the USMCA is one of them. Uh, uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is now the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership in the absence of the United States. Uh, a new regional uh, cooperation and economic partnership uh, that includes China is yet another example, but there are hundreds more. These regional agreements all take away from the centrality of the overall global trading uh, system that is based in the WTO. Now, why does this matter? Um, to some extent, these agreements can help uh, uh, world trade overall by being proving grounds for new ideas and new approaches in lowering barriers to trade. This has happened in digital trade, for example. Uh, but uh, recall what I said about the importance of the basic WTO rules um, against discrimination. A free trade agreement from between two countries, any two, is in effect in an agreement to lower 
barriers to trade between those two without lowering them on anyone else. So it is by definition an act of trade discrimination. The fundamental rule, uh, a rule much misunderstood even by members of Congress uh, in uh, the WTO treaty uh, uh, permitting discrimination is the rule of most favored nation treatment. This is a rule that says that you cannot discriminate in trade between and among the traded products, the imports from any other country that's a member of the WTO. This is a very important rule in part because when you are agreeing to lower barriers to trade on any one product with any one other country under the WTO legal framework, you must also lower those barriers to trade on the same terms to every other member of the WTO. This is the reason why we try to have multilateral fully global trade agreements because the bang for the buck economically is so much more. If any two countries that are in the WTO agree to lower their barriers to trade on any one product, they have to do it worldwide. So this multiplies the potential trade benefits uh, from uh, WTO agreements. In contrast, these regional uh, and bilateral agreements uh, pose the risk of undermining uh, this uh, global uh, uh, non-discriminatory uh, obligation, uh, as well as uh, sidelining the WTO uh, as an institution. Now, I'm all in favor of uh, many of these regional agreements. I was one of those people when I served in the Congress uh, who helped pass the NAFTA. But the centrality of the WTO is always uh, something that should be uppermost in the minds of all uh, trade policy makers, wherever they may be. Thank you for those answers to that question. And we have a question, I think, from Mr. Gowan from one of the students joining us from Russia. We have seen an increase in military exercises and activities and just in general, an increase in collaboration between China and Russia. To what extent do you think this will continue in the diplomatic circle, namely the Security Council or in any other specific multilateral institutions? Will we see an increasing amount of collaboration to offset the P3 in the West and the US? And what will this mean for the efficiency of the Security Council? Well, I mean, that, that links to my, um, my previous remarks, which is, you know, firstly to highlight that in the council, you know, it is Russia that remains the sort of most regular and most um, uh, assertive opponent of, of the P3. And China, um, uh, you know, some would say hides behind Russia on many occasions, you know, often casting vetoes on questions like Syria with the Russians, but, um, you know, not so often uh, really taking a prominent role. Um, but I, you know, I would also pick up on my, my earlier remark, which is that we, we do still see the Chinese looking for um, some space to work with Western countries on issues like DPRK and Myanmar. Uh, that actually makes the Russians quite uncomfortable uh, during the period where the Trump administration and the Chinese were talking quite constructively on, on DPRK in 2017, 2018. Uh, the Russians um, made it uh, very clear um, that they were worried about being cut out of um, uh, discussions of DPRK, which is after all also in their Eastern neighborhood. And I think it's, it's pretty clear that the Russians have never implemented any of the sanctions that the, um, the US and, and China uh, agreed upon. I mean, China's own implementation has been mixed, but, but Russia has just tended to ignore the restrictions as far as we can tell. Um, I mean, on other issues like Iran, uh, you increasingly hear Western diplomats say that they think that although the Russians do a lot of the talking, um, the Chinese are actually increasing, 
increasingly setting the agenda um, behind the scenes. And that to some extent, the Russians are fronting for the Chinese in, in discussions of issues like, uh, like Iran. Um, so I think there is a sense of a shifting balance between the two with uh, you know, the, the old big brother, little brother relationship, um, which the Russians were very comfortable with being replaced by um, something more like, more like parity. Uh, what I would say is that, you know, over the last 10 years, at various different times, Western diplomats have sort of said to me, you know, you know, the great goal is to split the Chinese from the Russians. You know, the, the Chinese and the Russians don't really have the same interests. We can, you know, we, we really can sort of, um, you know, pull the two apart. I think that's unrealistic. Um, just as the P3, um, France, UK, US stick together um, in the council, Russia and China will, um, I think, always gravitate back towards one another as um, uh, natural partners. And efforts to split the Chinese away from the Russians have, uh, have you know, typically yielded very, very little um, in the end. I think that's a really valuable insight. Thank you. I also, just before we continue with uh, questions, uh, want to acknowledge that we did have a third panelist who was planning on joining us today, Hugh Dugan, but he's unable to be here just because something came up with a, a conflicting conflict of scheduling. So we'll continue with the two, um, two of you guys and thank you again for joining us. So our next question comes from uh, an EPIC student. China has a better record of complying in WT rulings than Americans. And why do you think Americans tend to think otherwise? And then for Mr. Gowan, you mentioned that China's um, sort of has an overstated influence in the UN right now. And why do you think that is? And for both of you, what do you think the consequences of, of these narratives are? Mr. Bacchus, let's start with you. Bacchus. Well, quite simply, uh, Americans tend to think otherwise because they have a president who lied to them. Uh, Donald Trump uh, told Americans over and over again that we had lost all the cases in the WTO. And the truth of the matter is the United States has won the vast majority of the cases it has uh, brought against other countries uh, in the WTO, including its cases against China. And the United States has lost a number of cases uh, because uh, uh, the United States has uh, refused uh, in any number of instances to comply uh, with uh, the WTO rules that the United States itself uh, largely wrote in uh, negotiations that established the WTO on the trade remedies that are often applied uh, by uh, the American government. These remedies are trade restrictions at the border uh, against uh, uh, alleged unfair trade practices. There are rules to which the United States has agreed uh, about how these uh, measures can be applied. And the United States uh, has tended to ignore them whenever it wished to do so. This was a longstanding practice, but it was uh, exacerbated uh, greatly in the Trump administration. I, I think, uh, you know, since I'm talking to many students, uh, 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 here, I'll uh, indulge myself by uh, explaining a little of uh, why I think this is the case in the United States. Uh, the United States has always been ambivalent about international engagement, and one aspect of that ambivalence has been uh, an American ambivalence about international law, including compliance with international law. Uh, on the one hand, we have probably done more than any other country uh, to help create international law, including uh, through the establishment and the workings of the WTO dispute settlement system, which has produced more international law than any other international tribunal in the past quarter of a century. And, but at the same time, there's, there's always this don't tread on me mentality in the American psyche. Uh, you know, who, who are these people from other countries to second guess us? Uh, we are perfectly happy in the United States for international tribunals to rule in our favor and against other countries. 
but whenever those tribunals rule uh, uh, against us, well, they must be wrong. And on what uh, basis do they have a right to do that? Uh, this is a continuing problem uh, in American uh, public life. Uh, it's not getting much better. Uh, I think we'll see a better approach in the Biden administration uh, in meetings with the Chinese in Alaska yesterday, our new Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, was telling the United States that, uh, that was telling the Chinese that uh, they need to support the, and I quote him, rule-based order. And what I would say to the Secretary of State with whom I agree and uh, everything he said uh, to the Chinese is that the best way uh, for us to get others to support the rule-based order is to do so ourselves, including in international trade at the WTO. Thank you for, for those comments. I think that's an interesting perspective. Mr. Gowan, do you have a response? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, why, why do we sometimes overestimate or overstate China's degree of influence. Um, I mean, firstly, I would say that uh, the Chinese themselves um, have, uh, you know, they do have a strategy or um, of sort of trying to change the narrative or the discourse around uh, the UN. And this is something that I think Xi Jinping has, has said quite explicitly, that he feels that it's necessary to sort of change um, change the concepts and ideas that are being discussed um, in, in the organization. So there is an ideological element. And um, after basically quarter of a century where Western ideas predominated in UN discussions, uh, you know, China is successfully pushing back on that. And so if you focus on, uh, you know, if you focus on the discourse, if you, you know, spend your time reading General Assembly resolutions, um, which I wouldn't necessarily do, uh, you, you do see the language, the language cha changing. And I, you know, it's easy to see that, but then that sometimes distracts us from the realities of you know, China's relatively small budgetary contributions, for example. On the other hand, I think that uh, the Trump administration, um, uh, partially, you know, the Trump administration um, because it distrusted multilateral institutions per se, um, was always uh, really strongly on the lookout for evidence of China's influence in them. And uh, for domestic political reasons last year in, in particular, uh, the Trump administration took, you know, real allegations, for example, of uh, China manipulating the WHO and then blew them out of all proportion because that served Trump's domestic agenda. So there are actually people on the US side who have a, uh, an equal interest to um, blowing up the sort of um, bubble uh, of Chinese influence at the UN. I think, I mean, I, I, I don't think this will change completely uh, with the, the Biden administration. Um, I actually sense, you know, talking to friends and colleagues in Washington that there's pretty much a bipartisan consensus uh, in, in DC, that China has gained too much influence in the UN. And of course, for many um, Democrats and you know, many liberal voices in US politics, uh, China is pushing back against exactly the sort of progressive norms um, that, that liberals value. So um, across the US spectrum, I think uh, you have people who, who naturally tend to, to focus on what China is doing and um, naturally tend to sort of uh, perhaps overinterpret um, some of its behavior. Thank you both for your insights on that topic. I think that was a really helpful framework to help us decipher between what we might be hearing that's falsified or exaggerated and what, what we actually see China doing in these spaces. I want to transition the conversation uh, to a little bit more of a historical question, a question from Ben, an EPIC student. In the 1990s, we saw the United States help integrate China into these global organizations. Has China taken any similar role with any other nations now that it's in a position of power? And if so, why has it chosen to do so with those particular nations? And I'll open this to either of you. Uh, 
Well, let me start with with, uh, with Trey. Um, just as a little personal uh, background, uh, uh, when um, I was a young trade negotiator for the U.S. government and not much older than uh, the students who are asking these questions, uh, uh, I was uh, one of those who was tasked with helping implement the first uh, bilateral trade agreement between the United States and China. Um, later in the Congress, I, I was one of uh, uh, those who um, uh, led the way in uh, granting permanent normal trade relations uh, with China. Uh, then I was, of course, an advocate for bringing China into the WTO. And in, uh, when I was uh, the chief judge, uh, the chairman of the appellate body of the WTO, I had the, um, the task of ruling in China's first appeal as a member of the WTO uh, in a case that China, the European Union, and others uh, had brought against the United States relating to uh, uh, restrictions on uh, imports of steel into the United States. And uh, I had uh, the uh, responsibility there of ruling against the United States in favor of China and, and the other countries. Um, so I, I'm very much uh, someone who has been in favor of bringing China into the trading system. Um, and other countries have also uh, come into the system uh, since the WTO was created. We had about 100 countries who were members of the WTO when we created it. And while I was still in the Congress uh, through the uh, Uruguay round, the multilateral trade negotiations. Since then, we've added dozens of members. There are uh, 164 members now, countries and other customs territories around the world. So uh, my point is we're, we're getting a little short uh, on countries that are still not members. Iran's not a member, some others, uh, but um, it's getting uh, harder and harder to find countries to help become members. Uh, China has participated uh, in assisting other countries in uh, the, as it's called, accession process since it became a member uh, through the institutions that do that within the WTO. But I don't know that China has singled out any other country uh, to try to help. Uh, in the negotiations on China's entry into the WTO at a time when China had relatively little technical knowledge about uh, trade law, uh, it, US negotiators were, uh, in fact, a big help uh, to the Chinese. Um, and educating them about what was needed. But now China has some of the best uh, uh, legal experts on uh, international trade law uh, on, on the planet. Um, this is still uh, uh, something that stands in the way of a number of countries getting into the WTO. They just don't have the domestic intellectual expertise to do so. So much that the WTO has been trying to do uh, is outreach into a lot of these countries, largely poorer countries, that are in need of the, the kind of technical assistance uh, and capacity building and expertise that's necessary to become a member of the uh, WTO-based uh, multilateral trading system. Um, Gwen, I would, looking at the UN uh, scene, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the Chinese would say that the US did help integrate them into the UN. I mean, the, you know, the great drama in the 1960s and 1970s was... Um, well, I, I was speaking of the WTO. Oh, no, sorry. No, I, I'm, I'm thinking now of back in the UN, the UN space where there's a different, <laughs> uh, a different, a different history. You, you know much more than I do about the UN history. <laughs> no, I mean, it, and it is a different story because... Please I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, there was a great... You know, there was a, a long battle between 
Beijing and Taiwan over who should hold the, um, the Chinese seat in the UN. And in the early 1970s, uh, Beijing finally um, managed to take the seat from Taiwan, but very much with the support of developing countries, the G77 and the non-aligned movement. And really from the 70s until you know, about 10 years ago, uh, the Chinese stayed very close to the G77 and the NAM uh, in, in the UN. Um, and uh, there was you know, quite a strong feeling that on most issues, the Chinese would take a lead from uh, other developing countries in the UN unless they had very specific interests of their own. Now that has really changed in the last 10 years. Um, there's a sense that China is increasingly less beholden to its old friends from the G77 NAM and on issues like climate change that actually the Chinese are, are trying to exploit the group um, to promote their positions. But you know, quite a lot of the time you feel that there's actually growing friction between some of China's old friends in the developing world and, and Beijing. And so I mean, it, it's just quite, it's just a very different history, I think, in the two organizations. Um, but I, I would emphasize this point that uh, whereas China used to be seen very much as a, a champion of the global south of the UN, it's now got a much less easy relationship with the global south, which may, may actually create some political space for the US and others to uh, to maneuver around the Chinese in UN diplomacy. You know, part of this difference, I think, uh, and I think Richard would agree, is that these things happen 30 years apart. So moving the conversation forward a little bit, um, another question from an EPIC student. Do you believe that if there's an increase in Chinese influence in international institutions, it will lead to a decrease in global confidence when it comes to these institutions? And more specifically, what is the best pathway for international institutions to renew faith in information sharing between China and the world, especially given what happened recently with the WHO and coronavirus? And Mr. Gowan, I'll have you jump in first because I know um, you have something after and I want to make sure you have time to speak on the matter. Thank you, Gwen. Yes, unfortunately, I um, uh, I have to switch over to the UN commemoration of um, 10 years of the UN failing in Syria, which is a rather um, rather miserable uh, milestone that we've just reached. Um, you know, I think, I think that that question puts its finger on something that uh, I have been worrying about uh, in recent years, but unfortunately all my worrying hasn't led me to a sort of a, a really strong idea about how to deal with the problem. And what I worry about is that, uh, you know, most of most multilateral organizations, WHO, um, a lot of the technical agencies in, in Geneva, you know, their, their strength is that they're impartial and they handle um, specific policy areas in a, in a largely apolitical way. And, you know, the Security Council is political, inevitably mediation is political, but a body like the WHO, uh, you know, prior to COVID, you know, was normally seen as you know doing good work on malaria, and you know there, no one is in favour of malaria, so um, you know that was fine. I think that we increasingly see, though, in competition between the U.S. and China, it's getting harder and harder for multilateral agencies to keep on playing that impartial role. Um, whether it's in terms of delivering services apolitically or providing um, data uh, and policy guidance. Um, you know, the, the tensions between the big powers are politicizing a lot of areas of UN activity that um, were previously below the radar. And I do worry that over time that will just decrease the credibility of a lot of um, multilateral uh, agencies. I mean, I think that you know, the, the real onus here is to some extent on the Europeans, on middle powers, um, Career and so on, who have invested quite a bit in multilateral agencies in the last 30 years, and who I think need to sort of use their combined political weight to try and protect um, bits of the UN system from uh, these political pressures. But I think it will be extremely hard. And on that note, I'm afraid I have to, to drop off, but it's been a pleasure to join you and really fascinating to, 
uh, hear from James as well because I've, I've never been smart enough to do trade. So <laughs> I've, I've learned a huge amount in the last 50 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gowan, for joining us. Um, it was wonderful to hear you and hear your remarks today. So thank you again. Thank you. And uh, go ahead. Well, I, I thought I would try to answer, answer the question. First of all, I agree with what he just said, but uh, I, I'm concerned uh, about my fellow Americans uh, and our leaders in both parties that they uh, somehow have talked themselves into believing that uh, Chinese participation uh, in international organizations is per se dangerous. Uh, I worry more about what the world would be like if China did not participate in these organizations. I also believe that uh, the rest of the world benefits more if China succeeds economically than if China does not succeed economically. Um, the, the world would truly be at risk if uh, uh, China was imploding uh, from uh, economic uh, disarray. Um, clearly, I'm not one of those people who believes uh, in uh, a win-lose proposition uh, philosophically for the economy. I, I think that we all can benefit. Uh, um, uh, if you don't believe me, go re read Adam Smith. And also, I think we have to, as a last point, uh, separate uh, the Chinese government from Chinese people, even when those people may have been uh, um, associated or affiliated with their government before they joined international institutions. Um, on the appellate body of the WTO, for example, um, which thanks to Trump is not currently functioning, but uh, I think will be uh, soon again, there are seven judges who serve the entire system. They have to be from somewhere. Uh, and, um, so they're going to have a nationality, but uh, in the 25 years in which this system has existed, these judges have all shed their nationality as soon as they have crossed uh, the threshold of the judicial door. Um, I did that. Um, and I had uh, two Chinese colleagues over the course of uh, time who had uh, significant relationships with their government uh, previously, but as soon as they became judges on the appellate body, they shed their nationality uh, because uh, the belief uh, shared by all members of the appellate body is that uh, their own countries will benefit the most if the uh, world trading system benefits the most. Absolutely. And we have one more question, Dr. Backus, for you. Um, and we'd love just to end on a more lighter note. Uh, so if you have any stories to tell us on this matter, um, please feel free to share them. But again, it's fine if you don't. This question is coming from a Tufts alumni who is now a PhD student in Hong Kong. One pillar of the so-called English School of International Relations is the idea of an international society in which the diplomats have a lot of agency. They socialize with their counterparts from other countries and the interaction can influence the thinking and behavior of their parent country. Can you describe your experience working with Chinese diplomats who were based in Geneva? How much socialization do they have with Western diplomats and how much agency do they possess to craft, to craft China's foreign policy as opposed to just simply being microphones of the CCP leadership in Beijing? Very few diplomats, whether they're from China or anywhere else have much discretion in shaping policy on the ground in these institutions. They answer uh, to their capitals. Uh, there is a great deal of socialization and there is a great deal of socializing uh, among these diplomats. Now, when I was a judge, I didn't socialize with any of them. Uh, 
I socialized only with the other judges uh, because we had to maintain uh, not only our independence and impartiality, but also the appearance of it. But it's been some time now since I uh, served on the appellate body. Uh, the, the Chinese ambassador, the WTO, is a friend of mine, and uh, I have quite a few other friends in China. Uh, in addition to my uh, professorship at the University of Central Florida, I, uh, I have a university chair professorship at uh, Zhejiang University in Hangzhou in China, although I haven't been able to get back there uh, in the past year. Um, I think it's important uh, for uh, people to get to know each other on a personal basis, whether they're from, this applies to diplomats, this applies to members of Congress, uh, especially these days. Um, the uh, personal relationships can often make a, a, a real difference in muting differences. As someone uh, who has gone back and forth to and from China and the United States many times over the years, um, what strikes me the most is the misunderstandings that Chinese people have about the United States and the equal misunderstandings that Americans have about China. Um, their assumptions are often completely wrong on uh, each side of the Pacific. And we can only benefit from spending more time together, talking together, working together. Uh, and uh, lastly, I, I'd like to say that uh, the two countries are going to have to work together if we're going to solve uh, a, a lot of the global challenges we face, uh, including foremost, um, this uh, pandemic now, uh, and also uh, climate change. Thank you for those comments. Do you have time for one more question? We had another one come in. I do, I, I have time uh, if you have time. All right, wonderful. So this question I think really extends um, on the conversation that you were just talking on about the importance of working together. Um, so as a former Congressman, how do you see um, the ability of the U.S. Congress, which obviously right now is incredibly partisan, to work together to develop a coherent plan um, to address China? Well, one of the few areas of uh, seeming partisan seminent in the Congress now is on China. What I worry about is that uh, in, in much of this sentiment um, doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, true economic understanding underlying it. Um, I'm worried now that um, uh, the Democrats uh, who uh, are in charge in Washington, and by the way, I am a Democrat, um, will make the same mistake that uh, the Trump administration uh, made in indulging in protectionism in trade. Um, the, the tariffs that uh, Trump uh, imposed on imports of Chinese products, which by the way are illegal uh, under uh, WTO uh, rules for the most part, um, should be repealed. Uh, Democrats see these tariffs as leverage. Whatever economic damage they did to China has now been internalized by the uh, uh, Chinese government and economy they're continuing to do much damage to the American economy and to our own production. And um, we can only gain from removing those tariffs. If we don't, once uh, dispute settlement is humming again in Geneva, we're going to uh, lose a lot of pending cases and uh, we're going to face lawful economic sanctions from China and other countries if we don't apply by removing the tariffs. Um, I'm also concerned that um, in looking at what's happening in China and putting together a China policy, uh, the uh, Democrats with the support of the Republicans uh, are going to be uh, uh, instituting um, a, a very mistaken industrial policy. Um, I find this ironic. 
Um, we have quite rightly been criticizing the Chinese for engaging in uh, protectionist industrial policies that uh, violate the WTO rules and uh, that uh, uh, feature far too much engagement by the Chinese government uh, in the market and uh, far too much direction by the Chinese government of market forces. We are quite right to criticize that. So what are we doing now in response? Uh, in, instead of doing more under WTO rules to try to discipline the Chinese uh, and keep them from uh, engaging in these kinds of policies, we've decided that we're going to emulate them. We're going to have our government get involved in dictating uh, uh, much more of what happens in the marketplace through subsidies and other dimensions of what is called an industrial policy, but is what Adam Smith would simply call mercantilism. It's a misguided state direction of the economy that uh, was wrong in the 18th century, didn't work then, is wrong now and won't work now. Um, I have a hard time understanding how we can be distressed that the Chinese are violating uh, these uh, basic uh, economic principles in which we Americans have long believed and have decided to re, uh, respond by doing what the Chinese have been doing instead of what we've done that's made America the greatest economy in the world. Do we continue to believe in what we've long believed in uh, as Democrats and Republicans alike in America or don't we? Thank you, Dr. Backus. We truly appreciate you sharing your time and experience with us today. I think the points you made were fascinating and leave much to be considered as we continue our conversations throughout the weekend. And I think as our epic class continues to study China throughout the remainder of the year. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And up next for our symposium is our small group expert led discussions on Taiwan, Hong Kong and China and the Global South starting at 1.30. Information on each has been put in the chat. We encourage you to choose the topic that you are most interested in. These panels will have a speaker, but will also include a lot of interaction between the speaker and the audience over Zoom, allowing for more discussion. We then begin our panels again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time with a look at China and nationalism and human rights. Once again, you can find the information on the chat on the, and on the IGL's website. And thank you again, Dr. Bacchus. It was wonderful to have you join us today. My great pleasure and my best to all the Tufts. Enjoy your symposium.